Let's move on. So today we're going to be talking about <clears throat> how to take hacking for $100, keeping your CTF costs out of jeopardy. So, first things first. Um, don't take everything that I say as gospel. Just know that I practice what I preach. So we're going to be breaking everything down into four main categories. And this is just kind of stuff that I picked up over the years. First things first. What is a CTF? So, a child trust fund is a long-term tax-free savings account for children born between the 1st of September 20, 2002 and 2nd of December 2011. It is also a counter-terrorism financing for the HMRC's approach to reduce the threat of terrorist financing by detecting, preventing, deterring, and disrupting the flow of terrorist finance. <sighs> right. Compagnon Tunisien de Farage, la CTF de poids de création judo de premier plan dans le développement dans l'activité de l'expression de développement pétrole de Tunisie. I think they're a petrol company. So, what a CTF actually is, is, stands for Capture the Flag. If you're new here, you probably already know what a CTF does. But we're going to do a quick, brief rundown of CTFs and how they've diversified. So, starting off with... Jeopardy. So this is the most common format that a lot of people will come against. As you can see, it's broken down into categories up the top, plus the score on the uh, going down. This is a very easy representation of difficulty as well. Um, teams race to get the most amount of points in a limited time. So that's that's pretty common. The next ones are kind of uh, attack and defense. So you've got things like with red versus blue. These are two teams who have nominated they're going to be doing offensive or defensive work. Blue team is tasked with maintaining services and defending against attacks. While blue team, or sorry, while red teams are tasked with trying to compromise the blue team servers. Then you've got things like King of the Hill. So this is kind of where you've got the teams that are a bit mixed, but they're trying to take over a central server where anyone is up for grabs. And so typically you'd have things like the red teamers would go in. They get in, leave the door open for the blue teamers who can then secure everything and try and hold on to it as long as possible. Then you've got some new stuff, which is things like hack the box battleground. So these are, you've got a list of typically four servers and each team is made of four different teammates and you have to try and compromise the servers as quickly as you can. So non-traditional CTFs. These are kind of the ones that have sprung up and are kind of an interesting way of looking at um, the new stuff that's out there. So You've got, for example, the DEFCON scavenger hunt. This is, you know, collect as many whack and wild things as you can. You've got the Trace Lab CTFs. This is, you know, using OSINT for good to try and um, help track down missing persons and aid local authorities. You've got Boss of the Sock. This is, you know, your typical blue team, what it's actually kind of like to be an analyst and so on. Um, then you've got Crack Me If You Can. This is, you know, password cracking, how to actually improve it based on word lists and better techniques and so on. Uh, then you've got the Mr. Robot ARG, which is sort of like long-running challenges that ran over the entire series to give you Easter eggs and more of an insight into the characters and so on. So, that's an introduction to CTFs. Now we're going to be talking about scope. So scope is, we're just going to start with the big stuff. So when you're doing your CTF, what you want to try and do is figure out some of the big questions that come with it. So a lot of this stuff is things like, how long is it going for? Where is it happening? what kind of timing, and so on. And this will give you a better understanding as to how to cater a lot of your content down the line. So, main things that you want to watch out for when you're dealing with this is keep in mind other events that will be happening at the same time. You don't want to overlap with you know, DEF CON or Black Hat or anything else like that and find out that no one's showing up. You also want to consider, are you catering towards teams or individuals? If you do that, it kind of has a knock-on effect onto your technical requests. You know, the amount of database requests and so on individually versus teams is, is a bit lower. But also, you want to try and figure out when are the biggest spikes during your competition. So a lot of them will be things like, at the beginning, you know, as soon as we find out that the challenge has started, it was hammering on the server. And then at the end, there's a major crunch, try and get as much as you can in. But then you might have some other stuff that would happen at the same time. So for example, at lunchtime, Everyone's going away and get food, and then suddenly they come back and it just, you know, slam them. Um, keep in mind, when you're trying to cater your CTF, who is your target audience? So these are the things like, are you targeting 
industry vets, students, kids, teachers. Just because someone's got technical experience in the field doesn't necessarily mean that it carries over to CTFs. And especially when you're designing your things, a lot of challenges might go with, all right, just get the flag, get root, and that's fine. But that's not always applicable to people in the industry. So they might not get that. Also try and figure out what ages you're catering for. Again, if you're going for students, they're going to be a little bit more techy. But if you're going for younger kids, you want to try and make it as accessible, but also kind of ramp up the, the difficulty as you go. And I'll get into this with um, some of the stuff later on. And then likewise, you know, are you targeting blue teamers or red teamers and so on? Then you kind of get into some of the meta stuff that's there as well. Now, if you're, are you running a theme? Are you going to be dealing with charity? Is this going to be raising money or is it just for your own club? If you are running something for charity or nonprofit, you could tie it in. So for example, if you've got, if you're trying to raise money for child's play, you could do like a kids hacking workshop and go, okay, that's great. Um, if you are making something family friendly, it doesn't have to be tied to kids. It doesn't have to be aimed at them. It just means that you can make it a bit more inclusive. So things to consider are, if you've got a team of, say, four 10-year-olds, and they're doing their thing, they're probably going to ask their parents for help. Does that mean that's also part of the team? Do you want to split them up or be that strict? Um, if you are including younger players, just be aware that some services as well also require you to be 13 years older. So things like Discord, for example, mean that you're over 13. Um, dum, 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 dum. Likewise, if you can figure out your completion rate, this will help you figure out how many challenges you need to provide for your audience. Again, if you're targeting younger kids, they might take a little bit longer because they're not entirely sure how CTF works or that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, we'll move on to the next one. When you are... So, again, this is kind of a meta thing. Try and figure out if you are making your competition like competitive, is it educational, is it fun? If you look at the different services that are out there right now, you've got DevCon, that's you know highly competitive, cutthroat, go, go, go. That's exactly what you're trying to go for. It doesn't matter if not enough people pick up your challenges or complete them because these are meant to be the best of the best. So it's up to them to get it. But if you're trying to do something like teach someone a concept or introduce them to hacking or something like that, you want to make sure that you have a high completion rate because then that way people are understanding what you're trying to put down. They're trying to collaborate with things like that and, and so on. You also have some fun challenges as well. Again, you don't have to focus on completion rate there, but think about is this something to showcase a cool exploit? Is this the new cool thing? Like logjam, heartbleed, whatever, just a, an interesting way to try and tie that into something else. If you look at the different services that are out there, you've got like... Defcon's the competitive stuff. Try hack me, hack the box. Those kind of things are kind of, you know, both competitive but also educational. If you look at Vonhub, for example, they don't have a leaderboard. It's just a case of, cool, download a VM, play around with it, do what you can. Um, lastly, when you're looking at your scope, are you going to be doing it in a physical space or is it a virtual space? And each of them have their own different considerations to watch out for. So... For example, if you're in a physical space, how many plugs do you have? Is the infrastructure Wi-Fi available good enough for what you've got? Is there enough seating? Uh, what's the COVID policy at this space? If you do something vir uh, virtual, it can be a little bit more difficult to advertise, get the word out. You don't need to worry about things like a COVID policy, but it is open to the internet, or it can be open to the internet. It's easier to abuse. Likewise, if you do it virtual, it's very easy to run up costs, and you do not want to wake up with a big bill. Um, an interesting use case of this is that this is actually a generator in Dublin. So Zero Days is a CTF that runs every year in April. And to try and tackle this issue, they were originally setting up in hotels in Dublin. But they found that they had difficulties with you know power and the venue and all that kind of stuff. Before, they'd self-hosted their kit and put a switch on all the different tables and just said, okay, connect up to that. Here's the IP address of the competition. Go nuts. But this time they decided to go with AWS. Now, 
This meant that they had ample seating, it was very easy to organize, everyone could sit wherever they wanted. But it also meant that when they're creating their challenges, you had to make sure, you know, nothing was using brute force or hammering the infrastructure, that kind of stuff. It also meant that afterwards, they had a great venue for the after party. So that's something to consider as well. Right, so scoping out the details, we've done that. And this is the easiest way that you can figure out and reduce your costs. Because once you got your scope down, you don't have to worry about that. So next, we're going to look at design. Now, design, there's lots of different ways that you can design a challenge, but one of the interesting ways that I came across is, so my partner is a UX designer. And as a result, you know, he tells me about these cool things that come across, such as a design system. So in UX, a design system is like a, a set of design standards that describe your product. So you've got documentation, principles, how they inherit, sorry, how they implement the toolkit, layouts, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it basically means that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So when you're looking at this for a CTF, you can basically do the same thing. Describe every facet of a challenge, right? So your name, the description, whatever else. This makes collaboration a lot easier because you're basically talking about everything. What kind of difficulty it's for, what kind of points it is. Common stuff, which often gets tripped up, is things like your flag format. You might say that you've got a challenge to give to someone else, not a problem. It's already been done from another competition. But then they've got a different flag format, which it's not difficult to change on the infrastructure, but it's a bit of a pain, and then sometimes it's just not standard. So if you can, you know, it looks better if it's all the same. Um, then you've got a style guide. So a style guide in, if you look at uh, design systems from a UX point of view, there's sort of like a high level set of guidelines, whereas a style guide is a low level set of rules that kind of describe each component individually. So in this case, you've got here, this is the gov.uk style guide. And as you can see, whenever you're talking about anything, so bank details, you say, okay, when you're paying a government body, use spaces rather than hyphens in, si in sort codes. You know, you've got a list of ban words, here's the words to avoid, technical text and so on, use backend, not backend and so on. And just a quick side note, gov.uk, all their stuff, they've got so much open source stuff that it's surprising considering it's a government body. But anyway, you can use this to try and outline some stuff like, for example, with forensics, you know, any of your challenges have to be a maximum of 50 megs in size. If it's a, a Docker image, it has to be able to fit on a you know, T2 Nano and that kind of stuff. And these just kind of standardize it, make it a lot easier to work with. Now, what's interesting is that until recently, a lot of competitions didn't have a style guide. But DEF CON, I think, is one of the few that have started to brought it in. And you can see this here. They basically have a blog post that describes all the different aspects of DEF CON 29. So you've got things like, you know, what kind of font do they use? What kind of palette? What's the key phrase? These are the inspirations that describe what they're trying to achieve with DEF CON 29. And this basically bleeds down into the villages, the competitions, and so on, and kind of unify it under one roof, reinforcing the idea that we're all part of the same tribe. And this is kind of the same with every DEF CON. They try and say, we are all in the same group, you're not alone, that kind of thing. Now, as a quick aside, one of the best ways to um, do a bit of a litmus test for your players is what I call baby's first flag. So this is nothing special. Essentially, what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, make sure that the, the user is able to use your platform, right? So this is all very simple stuff. It's just like, enter this into the flag text, to get the flag. And you get, you know, paltry 10 points or whatever. Very easy, very easy to incentivize. But this makes sure that if a user is able to do this, they can get through all the different challenges of registering. So platforms online, emails working, captures working, they can read, which sometimes that's not always the case. Um, but more importantly, they can submit a flag. So this means that they're able to complete the basic user journey for using your platform. And then if they have any other issues, they can move on to that. Right, so the, it's also a good one to use as an example for other challenge designers. So if you're on the same team, you can say, look, this is what I expect you to do. Here's the format, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> so PicoCTF is a very interesting 
um, group at the moment. They basically started in Carnegie Mellon University, launched in 2013 by a student group. And when they started off, it was, you know, 6K participants, all great. The main thing I want to highlight is, first of all, they make the challenges that they've got available to anyone, right? So they have a new platform that's available called Pikachu. And it means that you can basically submit, if there's a competition that happens, you're not happy about it works or you want to try it later on, you can take a look at old challenges, the current ones and so on, see how it works, and just basically play around with it at your own pace. Now, this is important because they've written two papers about using CTFs to try and get um, kids interested in hacking. So the two main ones were problem generation for capture the flag competitions. That was basically about uh, making unique challenges, dynamically creating challenges, and basically making something where you can go, okay, we're going to talk about forensics, forensics today. How do you make a forensics challenge? And you just go, blam, there's one ready made. And this means that whoever's the, the players that are going through the challenge, it's, you know, improved education experience as a result. Then you've got um, the other white paper, which is how to avoid scaring players away. Sorry, how to avoid scaring students away in a CTF competition. Now, the summary of this one is basically they were trying to gear their CTF challenges towards younger audiences. Like we're talking like eight, nine, 10 year olds. And the way that they did it is they started very easy and very slowly ramped it up. And they found that as you introduced more introductory challenge, very beginner friendly challenges, then the kids loved it because it just, they go through it very quickly. And then that means that they're not as intimidated to move on to some of the more difficult stuff. Um, briefly, out of the Pico CTF uh, stuff came the Play Parliament of Pony, which is their own capture the flag team who've been, you know, doing leaps and bounds. They're one of the best ones that are out there on the planet now. And it means that they actually run their own CTF as well called Play CTF. So what I want to do next is what's interesting is with uh, Carnegie Mellon, sorry, with Pico CTF, in the last couple of years, they've actually, they outsource a lot of their challenge creation to students who are studying for um, cyber courses. But they're using that as a way to try and grade some students. Now, what's interesting is that with these, there's a, a little bit of a, a distinction between the quality in these. Now, I'm not critiquing them necessarily, but I'm just some highlighting some interesting stuff that came out of it. Um, let's just take a quick drink before we go into that. So, first of all, let's look at the description itself. On the left-hand side, you've got stonks. So the description for this, it's very vague. It's not very clear exactly what you're trying to do, how you actually solve this challenge. Even in the hints itself, it's like, oh, okay, well, maybe if you can find my API key, you'll be able to do it. Now, keep in mind, this is a 20 points challenge. This is meant to be one of the most easy stuff. And at this point, you're expected to do you know, web, reverse engineering, maybe pwn a server, that kind of stuff. You're given the source code for a C file, and then you're told, okay, use Netcat to try and get into it, and then talks about an API key, and it's like, what? This is meant to be something that's, you know, the first thing that people will come across. So the points to effort is way off. Compare that to Matryoshka doll. Now, this is pretty low. Points to effort is a little bit still askew, but the important thing is that the description is a lot clearer. Can you find the final image? Here's the final image. The hint is a lot more useful as well. You can f hide files and find in other files. This one is a standard stego challenge. All you need to do is use steg hide to extract the image and then do it a couple of different times and then away you go. Now, in a standard user journey, they have to learn about steg hide and steganography. It's a little bit of a dangerous territory, but as you can see here, the number of people who attempted and solved the challenge with stonks is a lot lower compared to Matryoshka doll. And then again, you have this additional uh, metric, which is how many people actually liked it. You might have solved it, but you might not be happy with the result. And you can see on this one, it's a lot higher. So again, we've got another one, which is same idea. But what's interesting is that with uh, like 100, the description 
isn't quite clear, but if you combine that with, you know, the description, the name, and the hint, it's pretty clear that all you need to do is basically untar this file. You've got to do it a thousand times. And then with the hint, it says, okay, well, you just got to script this. But if you look at information, it's not very clear. And the hint itself is quite redundant. You know, it tells you, here's the flag format. But you already know, because it's there. Likewise, the points to effort ratio is completely off. Like 100 gives you 250 points. This is almost what would be considered a medium challenge. But if you can script it, easy, not a problem. So, once you've got your design out of the way, let's look at infrastructure and hosting. So, when you're looking at your infrastructure, the first thing you want to do is look at your platforms. This is what people are going to be interacting with when they're actually trying to solve your challenges and so on. There's lots of different ones that are out there. I prefer CTFD because it's one of the more mature stuff that, that's there. Pico CTF is, you know, fantastic as well, but the only problem is they stopped making their uh, platform open source in 2019. Still works great, and there's nothing stopping you from running it. But each of them have their own sort of plus and minuses. If you think about your platform as kind of like a content distribution system like WordPress, it's just meant to be a, a front for the users. You're, you're front end, basically. But that handles things like user management, scoreboard, rules, that kind of stuff. Um, there's also a fantastic list that I'd recommend called Awesome CTF Platforms, which just goes into a massive depth of all the different ones that are out there. Um, when you're actually trying to figure out your infrastructure, first of all, start with a minimum viable product. Get to know how your infrastructure works. And the easiest thing that you can do is you know, you just get yourself a Raspberry Pi. Get some old computer. Hell, use your own computer or a laptop if you've got it. Set up the, C the CTF platform, your database, your file hosting. See how it works. See how it tinkers with it. If you've got experience with this kind of stuff already, great. But then move on to making it maybe a single VM. Just It's a basic web server. It's got a local database. It just you know, uploads onto the file system. Then, ideally, you try and make it a bit more scalable. So move from a VM to a container... A uh, local database to maybe a cluster or a relation database, or even just you know, a random DB server, that kind of stuff. Um, integrate cloud storage and that kind of thing. This gives you a better idea as to figure out your costs per head. Because then you can go, all right, if you've got a really good, if you've just got your CTF platform and you've got a thousand people who are trying to use your system at once, how many instances do I need? Am I able to scale it up and shrink it down dynamically depending on demand? Same thing with the different challenges. Once you've got that, then you can kind of integrate the other services that are available. Depending on, you know, if you're self-hosting or you're using cloud, you can kind of implement some extra stuff. So, for example, you know, elastic load balancing with uh, AWS or traffic redirection, fault tolerance, monitoring, all that kind of stuff. Now, if you go with anything to do with cloud, it's going to add some extra cost, but, you know, it's something that it's nice to have the tools that are there, especially with monitoring on the day. It's very important to be able to keep an eye on this because you might find, hey, you know, 10% of your traffic is being dropped mid competition. What's going on? Maybe the VM is broken or something like that. You want to try and make it as easy as possible for people to, you know, have a good experience. And having technical issues is, is not a good thing to do. Um, but it also allows you to monitor your completion rate. Again, you know, are people solving all of your stuff very quickly, very slowly? Do you need to do it in batches? Um, maybe lower the difficulty or release more hints for your different challenges that are out there. So looking at the different hosting options that are out there, you basically have cloud or self-hosting. Now, with cloud stuff, there's no ceiling on the resources that are available, but there's also no limit on the cost. Um, if you want to try and make things a bit more efficient, you can kind of roll your own services to replace some of the things that are on there. So, for example, instead of elastic load balancing, you'd use HAProxy. And again, try and get it to scale and so on. But as I go on to later, that can be a little bit of a headache. The benefit with cloud is that there's lots of documentation on there. You can learn everything that's available. And the services try and encourage you to use them at a cost. Um, but you can easily self-host your stuff as well. Again, if you know how many people are going to be playing based on your scope, then that gives you a better idea as to how much resources you actually need. You could run a CTF on a Raspberry Pi because 
You're just using a web server. But what happens if you get slammed? Do you under- understand um, the difficulties that come with reaching that ceiling and if you're prepared to deal with that? So this is the actual meat and bones of it. When you're trying to keep your costs low, figure out your scope. That's the main thing. The second thing is know the limitations of the gear that you've got and your budget, especially. So if you've got 400 pounds for all of your infrastructure, and then suddenly you find out that it's much more popular than it should be, are you accepted to pay more? Do you just want to pause it, or do you want to try and bring that down to a more acceptable level? But then that means the players have additional wait times, or you have to cut off and kill some challenges and things like that. You can use things like free tiers creatively to try and get more utilization. So for example, let's say you've got AWS does a free tier available for um, a bunch of different things, including tier two nanos. They give you 750 hours a month. It refreshes. And if you run that box constantly throughout the month, that basically means that it's about one month's supply. So not an issue. You can run a blog or something like that on it. However, Depending on the timing of your event, if it's at the beginning of the month, and that means if you're only running something for 24 hours, cool, you can bring up a bunch of different services and basically burn through that 750 hours very easily. But it means that you can come up against whatever traffic and things like that suddenly very easily. Um, What else we got here? So you can save a lot of money by rolling your own systems, but in doing so, you kind of it's very easy to go down the rabbit hole. So as I mentioned before, you can use HG proxy instead of um, Elastic Load Balancer, but then you have the extra technical debt of mm-hmm. trying to keep that up and running yourself. Um, what else we got here? Oh! Try and utilize some extra services that you've got there already. So for example, if you've got Dropbox Plus because maybe you're a student or you just pay for it anyway, that's a great way to save some money because you can use that for some extra storage. And I'll come into that in the next slide. But be wary if you're using any free tiers. Um, some of the cloud stuff is fine. You know, it, it works just like any other enterprise gear. But if you're using a free tier of Dropbox, for example, they only allow a certain amount of requests before they shut it down. And if you can, utilize what you've got already. So if you've got, you know, a local uni or something like that, and they're like, hey, do you want some, you know, servers or things like that? These are cheap. They're out of date, and they sound like a jet engine trying to take off. But it's free kit. You could use that if you need to. Um, Try and keep things simple, especially when you're trying to debug it. Because if you've got all these different systems, it might be very cheap, but it's a pain in the hole when you're trying to debug it. So, um... (laughs) Also, best way to save money, put in a, uh, a cost limit. Make sure that you don't actually overspend what you've got in place. Um, oh, that's another thing. Try and reuse a lot of assets. So, for example, let's say you've got three different challenges that are forensics. You've got one which is, all right, here's a disk image, and I need you to find the flag. You can then say, all right, challenge two, same disk image, but the flag is in a different location. And then same thing for three. So it's the same file, and it means that you don't have to upload three different um, files to cover three different challenges and it just kind of brings things down a little bit. Try and think about more offline based challenges like cryptography, forensics, OSINT, that kind of stuff. Even just like virtual machines that you ask the user to download. If they get a container that they can run on their own machine, that's a great way for you to not have to host it yourself and you can keep the challenges there. Uh, Troy Hunt has a great blog post about how he racked up 10,000 Australian dollars because he didn't properly set up cost limits or alerts, and he just had to pay it. Because, I mean, I mean to be honest, he probably spends that half the time anyway. But, um, yeah, so on the topic of storage, here's a quick comparison of the different uh, services that are available in cloud. So the main ones you've got at the bottom, like Amazon, Azure, Google... Google is by far the most expensive, but kind of go with what you know. So if you've got experience with um, AWS, technically Azure is slightly cheaper. But at the same time, if you're well-versed in one, it's probably easier just to deal with that, especially if you're the only one who's dealing with this or, or managing it. Likewise, you can technically use Dropbox. Watch out for Dropbox Basics specifically because they have limits onto how many 
downloads a particular file is there, how much actual space you've got. 20 gigs goes very quickly. Uh, but interestingly enough, if you've got any of the paid tiers, plus family, professional, and so on, it's only a tenner a month, and you basically have um, unlimited downloads. There's no cap as to where they're coming from or, or anything else like that. So if you've got that service exa already, you know, use it. It's great. Um, the best value spend that I have, now, saving money is one thing, but the best value in this, I would say, is cloud support. And there's different tiers depending on which provider you've got. But at the end of the day, you've got like, you know, your basic one, you've got your enterprise, and then you've got your really enterprise. The the different contracts that are available basically boils down to your um, SLAs and how quickly they'll get back to you. But it's always a good thing to have, especially when you're running an event for the first time. If something breaks, you've got someone you can call. They will turn around within like an hour or something like that and say, okay, cool. We figured out why your, your system didn't work. Uh, you just need to change this config, and that, that's fine. So this is a great spend if you can, because on the day, everything's going to be hectic. You're going to be trying to troubleshoot things. You run around like a headless chicken. Um, last thing I want to talk about is some extra tools that are in there. So SecGen and Juice Shop are great tools to kind of spin up content very quickly, especially with SecGen, you dynamically create challenges, kind of like the Pico CTF stuff where it dynamically changes flags and so on. If you just want to play around with a platform or run something for maybe a you know your local hacking club or something like that, these are great ways to get familiar not only with the existing stuff that you can model after, but get your infrastructure in place and, and get some experience with it. Um, the last thing, or sorry, I said the last thing, but other things to watch out for is when you do host your services, make sure that um, Cloud SecOps knows. For example, with AWS, you need to tell them at least a week in advance, hey, I've got this um, hacking platform, this competition that's going on. If you see malicious traffic going to these IP addresses, don't worry about it. It's fine. It's legit. We're keeping an eye on it. That's fine. At the same time, they'll know, hey, there's a whole lot of traffic going on here. We noticed that there's a whole lot of denial of service traffic that's getting hit. Is this you? And you can say, nope, that's not us. Cool. And they will mitigate it away. The cost, but it's there. Um, <laughs> likewise, keep an eye on your backups. Nothing worse than uh, trying to restore a backup mid-competition going, oh, it doesn't work. Not me, thankfully, but just <laughs> thing to keep an eye on. Um, what I'd say is then, the last thing is, if you want to try and encourage players to let you know about any infrastructure things, um, introduce some kind of a, a bug bounty program. Just something simple that says, hey, You've got a problem with your website. I found out that I can... No one's going to burn a zero day on a CTF, let's be honest. But if there's a bug or something like that, let them know. Just give them some extra points, uh, something token, something that, you know, just rewards them. It's good. So now you've got your infrastructure sorted. Let's talk about logistics. So this is basically just kind of tying up all the small bits and bobs to do the actual competition. So first of all, start early. Planning takes an awful lot of time, right? InfoSec is full of people with terrible time management skills. And we cannot estimate very well. So keep in mind, you're going to need some extra time. Things will break. Plan for fuck-ups. Um, try not to have a single point of failure, especially with access. You know, do things like separate your accounts just for the event. That way, if something happens, someone else can take over. Um, oops. Yeah, there we go. Uh, as you can see, Dark Tangent here of Jeff Moss says that planning starts as soon as we finish DEF CON. I mean, he's right. I mean, if you look at the DEF CON documentary, they're going, they're finishing up, they might take a break of a couple of weeks, but then they're straight back into it. I and mean, it's just because it is massive. It's the same thing for some of your competition. How are we on time? Okay. So, yeah. Um. Technically, this is a little bit more scope stuff, but try and figure out your time and, again, who your target audience is. If you are making a global event, um, some of the biggest industry uh, users out there are often, not always, um, in the UK, the US, Germany, Europe, that kind of stuff. And if you can try and figure out where your competition is best to overlap in those time zones, it makes things a bit easier, but it also is consideration for your infrastructure. For So, for example, 
you got here in London, if you kick off at about 1 o'clock, that's 8 a.m. or 5 a.m. for folks in the U.S. Not ideal. But then if they're finishing up at, like, lunchtime or something like that, and then suddenly you see a large amount of traffic coming in, you're like, okay, cool, the U.S. crowd have woken up. Um, try and introduce some mandatory breaks if you can, especially if this is something on-prem. A lot of folks get like tunnel vision when they're working on this, and that's kind of a blessing in disguise. Um, forces them to you know take breaks, go to the loo, have something to eat, and yeah, it's it's funny because a lot of people forget to eat when they're focused on this kind of stuff, but they need it so that they don't get burned out. So let's look at some of the marketing that you need to look at. So the best thing that you can do is again figure out: is this a virtual? Is this a physical event? Try and network with different communities that are out there. So some of the bigger InfoSec communities that are out on Discord, for example, you've got Dead Pixel Sec, Hack South, Digital Overdose. Funnily enough, Hack South is a South African Discord, but they're that prevalent and they do so many CTFs and things like that, that they're just out there. They're a great community. But again, try networks with some of your local stuff. So for example, if you are in uni and you know there's a kids hacking club or something like that nearby, See if you can loop them in. It's a great way to cross-advertise some of your different events. And same thing, you know, use Twitter um, to, to get your events and things like that. TweetDeck is a fantastic tool where you can queue up a bunch of different tweets about, you know, what's happening and so on, and you don't have to worry about making sure that you're in time. Um, so this poster is kind of interesting because we modeled it after a study by MIT. So... MIT had this thing where it was a, a simple A-B test where they said, all right, we've got two different loyalty cards. One of them has six stamps. And, you know, if you go to a coffee shop, you get a stamp, cool. The other one had eight stamps, but two of them were filled in already. And after a quick, you know, A-B test to see which one was more effective, they found out that the eight stamps that had the two extra spaces there were a great way to get more people interested. So this is kind of the same thing with what we did with our poster. So we tried to say, hey, look, you've got a head start. You've got 100 points just by seeing this poster. You know, grab one of these slips and so on. The thing to note with this poster as well is that we wanted to try and make it kind of eye-catching from a distance. This is only meant to be A4. But as you can see, like, the biggest thing takes up half the page. And, you know, that's my design. We ran this at EMF Camp. And as you can see, fairly grand, you know, lots of people were taking it. We actually kind of ran into a little bit of a bug when we were dealing with it, though, because it's all well and good saying lots of people took these slips, but we didn't have a huge amount of uptake afterwards. And it was because it's the, the text on the bottom says, golden ticket, uh, one per team. Great. But it doesn't say anything on the, about, uh, about the website on there. So you're expected to, you know, take a note of the URL or scan the, the QR code or something and then grab it. But a lot of people would come up to the notice board on the way to something else, grab a slip and be like, oh, I wonder what this is for. Um, watch out for rain as well, especially when you put up posters. This did not last. I'm not sure if you can see very well, but the QR code is absolutely banjaxed at the end. Um, and also, please tidy up all your posters. This is technically litter if you haven't picked it up. So let's talk about comms. So this is kind of your, let's say you got your event up and running. How do you actually reach people? How do people reach you more importantly? So Discord has an announcements channel, which basically is just basically your, your official announcements about blah, blah, blah. Here's the channel and so on. An interesting uh, technical note is that other communities can subscribe to this. So again, if you've been networking with other discords and so on, they can subscribe to your events and use that as a great way to easily advertise your stuff. Uh, you can also utilize lots of different bots out there to try and link in some of your stuff so that you're not running multiple different services at once. So for example, if you've got Twitter, you've got Discord, you've got IRC, whatever, you can run bots that basically link them all together and they just do it all at once. On the day, make sure you've got a comms area for staff. So it can be sort of like a green room for staff members to hang out and, and do whatever, talk about, oh, hey, there's, you know, some infrastructure or whatever that's there. But also try and make sure that there's a space available for you, uh, sorry, to make you available to other people. 
So hang out in some chat channel or something like that. That means that people can reach out to you and say, hey, something's going on or I'm having difficulty. Can you let me know? It's a great way to find out that, oh, there's some kind of um, technical issue. And that's why you're not seeing the uptake of the really easy challenge that you thought everyone would solve. Uh, what else we got there? Also, you know, big emphasis on making sure you've got moderators there to keep the peace, but also just help guide people who might need some help. Uh, okay. Um, so quick story time. So a couple of years ago during 44 con, we had an arc, which is an alternate reality game. And what we decided to do is we had a bunch of different cash prizes. We had Ethereum that was available for people to rob, essentially. The story was in the, the ARG, uh, we were launching a new ICO. It was going to be, a, you know, a fake pump and dump. New coin, 44 coin. Great. Everyone has one because they attended. And you can access that by going into our banking system, which is great, but it's only read access. So no one's actually able to move any of the money, but they can see it. Now, we wanted to make this a high stakes thing. And it was also, it was different from the other challenges because only one group or one uh, individual would be able to take all the money and then go. It was, you know, time sensitive kind of thing. There was about £4,000, sorry, £5,000 available for grabs. And what we did was, with this banking system, we kind of scattered it through all the different accounts. There was a vulnerability in there that was privilege escalation that allowed you to then become admin, iterate through all the money, or sorry, iterate through all the accounts, and drain them. Great. Then you got a bunch of cash. The problem was, we finished up the con, and people didn't take the money yet. They didn't realize what was going on. So, you know, we're saying, hey, you know, this is going on for a bit longer. You can keep at it, you know, dropping some heavy ins and that kind of stuff. The problem was one of the teams were too good and they'd gone past the solution. They didn't realize that this is what they needed to do. They'd gone on a completely separate rabbit hole. We found out um, after chatting with them at the bar, hey, you know, they were trying to fish for some hints and things like that. We realized that they were actually hitting a completely separate banking service, which had nothing to do with the game whatsoever. Even though in the rules and so on, we outlined, guys, this is a scope. Don't touch anything else like that. But they still thought, oh my God, there's 5,000 pounds available for it. So we had to reel them back and say, no, no, this is where you go. Oh, don't worry about that. Um, yeah, funnily enough, at the same weekend as well, Ethereum crashed. So, well, um, branding. Branding is a little bit tricky because for myself especially, usually I'll be part of another event and they'll be doing their own branding. And then this time... I'm kind of branding as myself. So there's not a huge amount that I can offer, except, you know, it's kind of like branding for anything. If you're trying to get into InfoSec, let people know who you are, even if it's just, you know, being active in the community, doing shit posting or whatever. Um, get a name, carve a name for yourself out there, let people know who you are, and just basically get people to go, oh, hey, you're Silverfish, you did the scavenger hunt and blah, blah, blah. Actually kind of helpful for myself because SteelCon was like, oh, we can't get into Twitter, uh, we can't get into Twitter properly. Who's the guy who did all this kind of stuff? And a bunch of people were vouching for me. Um, also, if you can, you know, support a local artist, get them to do the, the assets and things like that. It, it's very easy and usually it's very professional. Tickets, this is where you're trying to figure out, you know, what kind of platform are you going to be using? Is it going to be Eventbrite? Is it going to be like Tito, like SteelCon I'm using right now? But this also gives you a bad idea of what would you do if suddenly the cost, or sorry, the, the amount of people who are playing skyrockets very suddenly. If you can figure out your infrastructure um, per head, then that gives you a better idea as to how many tickets that you need to sell to cover your costs. Um, also, try and figure out your pricing for the target audience that you're going for. Is it going to be students, professionals, and so on? If it's cheaper or free, you know, a lot more students are going to be playing and, you know, so on and so forth. Also, always a good idea to include like a little donation tier, just in case people want to throw you a couple of bob. So, sponsorship. If you can't charge tickets or you want to get some extra cash, this is how you get it. <laughs> so, try and figure out, first of all, what do you need help with? Are you trying to cover infrastructure costs? Is it marketing? Is it getting people in there? Are you trying to cover volunteer costs? That kind of stuff. But also, what are you selling? So if someone sponsors you, 
what do they get in return? So is it things like advertising on posters, that kind of stuff? Are you trying to get um, maybe mentions when you're addressing the audience? As you saw in SteelCon, you know, they had, you know, thank you very much for blah, blah, blah. Here's an extra slide. At the beginning, all the, the leaflets and things like that, the company name basically gets plastered everywhere, and that's what you're trying to sell. But it's also a question of how much does that cost? Is it a simple case of, okay, um, if you want to do a branding package, this will get you, you know, advertising on the side, in the leaflets, that kind of stuff, but it'll cost you £200. And you can see here, this is what I did for EMF Camp. Now, don't worry about the, the zeros that are there. I, I assure you, I did get paid for some stuff. But um, when you're using... Uh, when you're using Eventbrite or any of these other ticketing systems, you basically use them as sort of like a payment processing system. So then that means you can kind of tweak it a little bit to try and get um, sponsors to use that and not have to ask for bank details or anything else like that. And they can just basically go click, add to cart, sponsorship is on the way. Um, right. So when you're trying to reach out to different people, make sure you've got a cover letter in place. So if you're doing like a, a cold call or anything else like that, you don't quite know anyone or you haven't networked enough, great way is to try and contact maybe the press at addresses or, or things like that. And just tell them, hey, look, this is me. I'm trying to do this thing. You know, why is it interesting and so on? Try and have a financial plan in, a plan in place as well as a way to justify your budget. So if you don't know exactly how much you need, this is a great way to figure it out but also gives you backup plans in case you find out that you don't have enough money to cover all of your costs. So reduce the number of volunteers maybe, or number of prizes that are available, that kind of stuff. So on the topic of cover letters, uh, when I was doing EMF camp, I was trying to reach out to a couple of different names in the industry. One of them is three letters. I'll let you figure that out. But I do this thing where I'm kind of like brainstorming in my drafts, right? So figuring out a couple of different things, everything was fine. I did a quick skim of the email, and then I sent it off. Great, not a problem. About a week goes by, and I'm like, oh, I haven't heard anything. What's going on? When I originally tried to find out the best address to send this to, people were saying, okay, well, you need to send it to the support at email address. And when I did that, I got a little autoresponder that said, cool, we got your ticket, not a problem. Awesome, okay. Then I go into my drafts, and I'm like, oh, God. I find out that what I'd actually sent was a half-written draft where I was trying to brainstorm some stuff to figure out how to actually reach them. And, of course, the best thing I did was I said, hi there, my name is James Bond. Hello. This is not <laughs> the best thing to do, but it gets kind of worse. When I actually went through here, I'm like, okay, cool. We've got, you know, CTF. We're doing it for EMF camp. This I'm okay with. That was, you know, semi-polished, all great. So far, mostly legit. The next thing, I'm like, okay, I need to figure out how to sell this. Why are they interested? That kind of stuff. Everybody loves hackers. Everyone loves kids. How would we, you know, marry this together? How we make it interesting for maybe some family folks and so on? And then, why am I so special? What makes me so great that I should actually ask for sponsorship? And also spell charity completely incorrectly. And of course, when I did this, it signed off with my signature just saying, ha, cheers, James. Needless to say, I did not get a response for that. Um, but let's move on to some of the prizes. So the different prizes that you can offer, obviously, is, you know, you can offer cash from a prize pool, or you can say, uh, let's buy some stuff. If you are a non-profit or, or something like that, you can try and reach out to different groups who sometimes offer discounts for individual um, groups or, or communities. So, for example, Women in Tech, BAME, LGBT+, that kind of stuff. If you are in contact with your sponsor, they may be able to donate um, some products or some time in the infrastructure, that kind of stuff, as a way to you know add to your prize pool. You can also, depending on your event, offer free entry. Use black badges and things like that to try and get people to come back. Um, but then there's also some other stuff like vanity rolls on a Discord server or whatever. If you're just in a hacker club, then that's a great way to say, you know, it's a limited time role. I participated. Great. Same thing with Badger. 
you know, it's kind of the same way, but kind of a, a wider audience. Um, also consider legal. So these are, you know, some of the, a bit of the boring bits that come up, but things like, look at your CTF rules. So these clearly define, you know, what's in scope, where everything is, everything's under, you know, XYZ domain. You can attack everything that's there, but only what's in there. Also, try and include a code of conduct. So this is just, you know, behavioral standards. Make sure that people aren't a dick and, and that kind of thing. But also, it includes ways for people to report an incident and then it outlines what happens when you actually do get an incident. Do you say, all right, well, if you are being a bit of a dickhead, we may ban you from our events. We may include the police. But it gives people that kind of assurance. Likewise, if you're doing a physical uh, event, you know, include the COVID policy. A lot of venues will have their own COVID policies that you can basically just bring in there or link to. Then you've got your privacy policy, which is just like GDPR, your cookies, what you use the data for, who's your data protection officer, how to uh, get a, or sorry, how to serve a subject access request, or if someone wants to delete their data, but also outline how long you keep the data for. So in summary, just to wrap up, Best way to save money, keep your scope easy. If you start changing things, it's not the end of the world, but you risk adding more costs on there. Um, good design isn't always apparent and is usually invisible, but bad ones stick out. Cloud costs a lot, but it's a very powerful tool. Be aware that you might need to eat those costs. And then logistics kind of puts things together, but a lot of different balls to juggle. The only other thing I'd say is some extra stuff that you might want to take a look at is these are some uh, blogs, papers, resources, and so on. The Play Parliament Poning, for example, have a great one on there that basically kind of covers some of the stuff that I pulled from here. Um, the Many Maxims of Max Milley Effective CTFs, unfortunately, was on a great blog, but isn't available anymore. So I had to use Web Archive to, to pick it up. Um, yeah, and that's me. Is there any questions? Talk about using cloud for this, which sounds like a great plan. Um, not a standard idea. Mm -hmm. um, is anybody supplying things like infrastructure as code through like terabytes sort of like, so you can repeatedly stand up the infrastructure, pull in uh, artifacts from S3 buckets. Mm. Um, that way, you know, you can size it. So, okay, this code will work for two hundred people. This will do for a thousand because it's a known quantity up front. You can predict the costs. Mm, mm, mm. Is anybody doing that kind of model, or is it all still click ops? Um, yeah, so your question is basically, is anyone offering CTF as a service, basically? Or the mechanism to do it yourself yeah. based on a known structure? Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of a double-edged sword. So I like using CTFD because of how mature it is, and there's a lot of thought that's gone into it. Um, and they offer you know, ways that you can just spin up an instance in Docker. But you kind of have to tweak it a little bit yourself. Sorry, you have to tweak it yourself in order to get a production ready. And the reason is because they have their own service that they basically provide and say, all right, if you want a CTFD instance with a handful of challenges and that kind of stuff, all you got to do is pay us 50 quid a month. And it's a great way for people trying to get into CTFs without having to worry about infrastructure. Maybe it's a small team, college hacking community, that kind of stuff. And they just want something that goes. Now, that's the big stuff. A lot of the things that I've mentioned are open source and they do use containers and so on to try and make it easy to bring up, but they don't usually say, all right, here's how you connect up um, to S3 or so on. There is some documentation, don't get me wrong, but it's not as click to run as you might expect. Um, usually they offer that kind of service because at the end of the day, they put a lot of effort into this to make sure that it goes well and they just want to offer a service themselves. I mean, I'm just thinking because the UTC leads have asked me to do something like this, and there are various cyber UTCs around the country, and people yeah. are working with them. Bet your dollars to donuts that the rest of them are going to come out of the woodwork and say, hey, can we do that too? And if you've got something they can run themselves fairly quickly and easily, then you yeah. be happy. I mean, it, it, this is the thing with these kind of services, right? Especially when you've got um, a paid service. You've got an SLA that comes with it. It's like they can take care of all the things like making sure that everything's got uptime, the data. You basically just have a bill at the end. You don't have to worry about, you know, making sure that you, 
don't properly provision or, or cost budget, things like that. Um, so it's a trade-off I mean, with any service. It's like saying, okay, well, do I want to have you know, a local Active Directory server, which does all that kind of stuff, but you have to provide the hardware, the certain licensing that you have to deal with and so on, usually an on-premises admin or maybe an MSP that takes care of it, or you can get Office 365. And, you know, it's a flat rate, you know, per user hosting, that kind of stuff. Um, it's a trade-off, that's all. Any other questions? So you mentioned before that obviously if you do this kind of stuff in AWS or Azure or some other cloud provider, that the majority of them have security policies in place for stuff like DDoS attacks and things like that. Have you ever seen any examples where they've actually had to auto-scale the actual underlying infrastructure because there's been a bit of a DOS attempt, a DDoS attempt or something like that, because you know what AWS will do that automatically and you burn the cost of that. Yes, uh, I can speak from first-hand experience. So a um, couple of years ago for 44Con, we set everything up. It was a very standard, very easy um, infrastructure, basically using CTFD and so on. And uh, we had an issue where at some point there was, I don't know why, but there was basically some kind of crawler or something like that that started hitting the infrastructure. And of course, all these different requests that weren't going through properly, it's like, oh, we got to scale stuff up. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we found out what the issue was, and we were able to contact Amazon, who were able to sinkhole the offending IP addresses. And then we put in some extra stuff to try and stagger those requests, like Cloudflare captures, that kind of thing. So that was fine, until afterwards, when we find out that we racked up about a thousand pounds worth of bill for just EC2 instances alone. So that wasn't fun. Um, but again, this is why you, you want to try and have those guys on hand so that if something happens, you can just go, please take care of it. I'm paying you to do this. Um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, that's basically it. Cool. Anything else? No? Okay.